Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. We are at the second Sunday of Advent, which falls on December 10th, 2023. And our readings are Isaiah 40, 1 through 11, Psalm 85, verses 1 through 2, and then 8 through 13. Second Peter, my goodness, Second Peter 3, 8 through 15a, and Mark 1, 1 through 8. Here we are, Advent 2. Begins with a baptism uh, and a baptizer. And a baptizer. But but particularly this, you know, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which is always such a interesting discussion and commentaries and expositions about Mark, what that means, and, you know, all the grammatical issues and whatever. But it does set the... I think a, a a theme or something for preachers to consider uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. What does that? What does that mean? Uh, what does it? What? Uh, how do how do we talk about the good news, or how do we talk about the gospel? And that the that the gospel of God, because God was about good news way before. Jesus came along, uh, that how is it that that the birth of Jesus is now uh, good news in a different form? And, you know, in particular, we get with with Isaiah text, so I don't want to jump ahead, but but that herald of good tidings is literally the one who gospels and the and the the one who brings good news uh, in Isaiah 40, verse nine. And then the announcement is, here is your God, that that is the good news. And so Advent is looking toward this, that the gospel is, here is your God, yet now in <laughs> the form of Jesus, in this presence of Jesus. And, and so I think that's worth exploring homiletically, is it, particularly when we get a little bit myopic in what we understand, what is good news or what is the gospel, particularly in our preaching. And we say, well, what does it, what does it mean to say that, that God's good news, God's gospel is now going to be incarnated in Jesus? And how might you unpack that? How might you help people think about what that, what, what is the continuity of God in that and what is uh, what is the newness that is to come in that? So that's one one homiletical impulse I have for this particular passage. Uh, one point that uh, um, I think I would thread uh, is well, two. I guess I have to confess. Um, one would be, uh, and I think I said this when we started year uh, B last time uh, that. Um, looking at Mark's gospel through Isaiah with the recognition that Isaiah um, holds in Israel's memory uh, the Exodus. And uh, so the threat that I would make is if you really paid attention to the waiting uh, and the absence and the cry for the call for the presence of God last week from the text, then read this text as the answer to that. God, the good news, God shows up and we are about to tell that story. And so we will begin with this ministry moment, this transitional ministry moment of Jesus when, uh, when we learn of the baptizer and all of the words of the past, Isaiah, have become true. The thread would be Isaiah is reading all of the promises of why Israel was uh, liberated from uh, Egypt are, have come true, and God has not given up on the promise that was offered. And we can read that in the same way. We're still waiting. We are still in an advent that is not the, the coming of the birth of Jesus, but an advent that is the return of Jesus where we see the fullness of this promise. But we can hold to this because God has shown up in the past 
God has promised and shown up in the past, and God has promised and will show up again. And so that's one way to, to, to kind of thread these, these texts together, Matthew, Isaiah, and um, Israel's story that has become ours. Uh, Mark, right? Yeah. Sorry. Right. I thought you were talking about me. Um, <laughs> that happens. Yeah, it's, you know, there's this threshold moment here at the beginning of Mark's gospel, where the threshold is between heaven and earth. Uh, the threshold is, I think, in the talk about repentance and baptism uh, for the forgiveness of sins and how that recalls both the entry into the land, but also the exodus itself. And there's this way in which I, I think John is is depicted as briefly as he is, as in many ways, an encapsulation of so many big moments in the history of this of this people. And I think I mentioned last week that Jesus there's something about the baptism that for prefigures the death for Mark in particular. And that's also this, either, it's either a threshold moment or it's the absolute obliteration of what we thought was a threshold um, mm. <laughs> and, and creates this open way now between life and death and God's presence and God's absence. So I, I think it's, it's to get, people into the mood, not just for the birth of Jesus or not just for our own repentance, but to start to think about the whole story. Uh, story is not the right word, but I mean, the whole history or the whole legacy, I think, and how that gets wrapped up in, in Jesus as Messiah and how we, how we enter into Christmas time, uh, again, in, in comprehension of that full story. I don't know what that looks like in a sermon, to be perfectly honest, but. <laughs> well, I, it, related to that, that's where I found the commentary by Timothy Ekin Jones really uh, insightful and helpful in that, uh, are there issues, he says, are there issues or community struggles that need Advent re-examinations? But then also really focusing on the role of John here because it's easy to, I think it's easy in Advent to focus just primarily on, right, the coming of Jesus and what that means. But John's role here of, as as Timothy pointed out, uh, a community's need in this season for return, repentance, and rededication. And I loved that sense of pulling out, teasing out, what is it that the role of John's baptism here, uh, the role of John as the baptizer here, what is that, what what kind of Advent stance is that calling us to, that we can't really kind of skip over that and say, well, Advent is, you know, the focus on, yes, it's focus on Jesus, but the, but placing John the Baptist here on this second Sunday is, is, calling us to, uh, I, I'll call it, yeah, an Advent stance, a way of of approaching Advent that has to do with uh, that, that, as he said, the return and repentance and rededication. And then how does that even change? As you said, Matt, how does that even change what Christmas is going to mean uh, when you think of it in that way? I think that uh, that focus um, really moves us into the Isaiah text, but I have to salute uh, Timothy also on the sandal strap fear and trembling. I will be using that. I absolutely love that um, imagery. Uh, and I, I'd, I'd never put that together before, but I think a whole lot can be done um, uh, homiletically with that kind of metaphor of what does it mean in the simplest, um, in the most um, um, necessary, um, you know, you, you have to have feet. <laughs> you, have, you have to have shoes on your feet. Yeah. Um, um, uh, in the simplest and the most necessary, um, and yet um, what it means for that to become also a stance of awe. Um, and and I, I I just think that that line can allow uh, the preacher to go in so many different directions 
uh, in terms of uh, what you just described, uh, who um, who John was and what was his ministry, um, a necessary simple ministry that was done in the awe of what God was doing, is doing, um, or um, the uh, familiarity and the simplicity uh, of Christmas um, that is a celebration of the presence of God that we should stand in awe in. I mean, there's so many different ways that that one little line can be used to work through uh, many angles in this particular gospel. Thank you, Timothy, for that. <laughs> I think Isaiah 40, if we can jump jump to that, I'd, I'd urge preachers to to help people put that into a historical context, of course, that, that help them recognize what's been going on in Isaiah, and now you've got a new voice I'm not sure you have to talk about all the composition theories around first, second, perhaps third Isaiah, but to talk about now we have uh, a, a voice announcing return and announcing restoration and how these words sound in the ears of people who have been forcibly displaced, uh, a way of talking about how this image of a, of a desert highway uh, looks geographically, like how do you get back to Jerusalem from Babylon? What's the most direct way to get there? And this idea of a highway upon which God will lead God's people as well, that, that the, the, the God has not been separated from them or absent from them, but God will now lead this, this triumphal return. And so much of the command here is about joy, is about song and and helping people kind of live into that, this idea of not just suffering and forgiveness or wrongdoing and and some kind of, of punishment, but also this idea of having felt forgotten and now being reclaimed, uh, so to speak, uh, by one's God and to pull people into the emotions of this text. I think, yeah, and <clears throat> absolutely. And I think also how you can pull people into the imagery the metaphor of this text as a, as you could take any one of these metaphors, I think, or the, these images and build an entire sermon, Advent sermon around that, that the way in which, uh, the way in which each one really encapsulate, can encapsulate the meaning of Advent or a, a meaning of Advent, I should say. And uh, so whether it's uh, it, the, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Uh, whether it's uh, every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain hill be made low, the uneven ground shall be made level and the rough places plain. Uh, here is your God. I mean, there's just so much here of and and familiar, uh, potentially familiar uh, ideas or claims about who God is and what God has done. God will... Uh, feed God's flock like a shepherd, gather the lambs um, in God's arms and carry them in his bosom and gently leave them the mother sheep. And there's just such incredibly beautiful imagery here. And, uh, and yeah, so that would be another direction I would take is to say, is there, is there a way you can open up Advent in such a way through this particular image uh, that, that leads people to imagine this time in, in a, in a in the concrete in a in a concrete image but that has such as you were talking about matt such uh such history behind it and such meaning behind it there could be a way to get at to the historical aspect of isaiah rather than doing you know <laughs> authorial theory and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. Yeah, the 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 uh, how many um, volumes there are to uh, Isaiah might not be the the most exciting uh, message, but um, uh, last week you asked the question, Matt, uh, what are we doing beginning uh, the year with waiting, and uh, I ended pointing that, and and I think this um, this week's text, uh, particularly um, the Isaiah text as you did, Matt, to set it in its historical context explains that. What are we doing beginning the year in waiting? Because this comfort verse came not right after chapter 39. It came after the exile. It came after people had experienced 
what they were told by the prophet that they would experience, what was coming in 39. And I think that folks do need to put it in that reality, that this is not a chronologically written book, that 30, 40 does not immediately follow 39. And so what we have also in our own experience is that um, God's presence among us may seem long in coming, but God will keep God's promise and God will show up. And that presence of God will be comforting for us. Um, the low places will be made high. Um, the high places will be made level. Um, uh, that, um, and, and that there will be someone who will be able to say, God is here. And hopefully, hopefully in our messages that someone might feel that sense of, I recognize the presence of God and I want to give uh, a, a testimony that others will recognize God as well. Um, Isaiah is uh, the book of my call. And so I always love it when folks can turn it to, um, I, I not only get it, I want other people to get it too. Psalm? Psalm. Lots of righteousness. <laughs> and restoration. Yeah, I appreciated the commentary talking about the, um, uh, by uh, Samantha Gilmore, talking about the the agricultural or the just the naturalistic imagery here of a garden and the idea of fecundity, right? Things, uh, things growing out of the ground, things coming down from the sky that nurture it, especially in December here in the Northern Hemisphere, when yeah. um, w at least where we live, not much comes up out of the ground. Uh, this time of the year. So there's a, a sense of promise there as well. I think of my tulip garden, just waiting there, just waiting for the right time, yeah. showing up sometime, yeah. probably like Not five now. months from now. But. Um, <laughs> well, and I, I really appreciated the, her, her last paragraph about how Psalm 85 invites us to see the ways in which salvation has and is breaking into our communities even now. Mm -hmm. And taking off the line, of course, surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him and uh, his glory may dwell in our land. And so that to think of, you know, Christmas and, uh, and Advent as a waiting for uh, is a, that salvation is at hand. And what does that mean? Um, and helping people think about, as the commentary said, that Salvation is not this, not just our future promise, uh, but it, but fully present in uh, in the birth, life, death, and resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And so, uh, <clears throat> how do you maybe how do you help people think about how what do we what does salvation mean in a particular uh, through the through the lens of Advent, um, and not just through the lens of um, Jesus' death. And she ends with the Trinitarian nod. <laughs> Appreciate. Yeah. <laughs> the work of the Holy Spirit among us. So Second Peter, everybody's favorite book. Yes. <laughs> what can we say about Second Peter that hasn't been said already? In the I pulpits? know. Exactly. Hope it's across the world. <laughs> so this is uh, a book that was not written entirely for this, but was largely written, I think, to assuage anxieties about the apparent delay in Christ's return. Probably the latest of all the books in the New Testament, maybe as late as like a year 130 or something like that. But there's kind of repeated, like, don't worry that he hasn't come back yet. He's really going to come back. And you can imagine how that would be the case, you know, a good hundred years uh, post, uh, post crucifixion. And so you know, one of the ways it does that is through reframing of perspective on time, mm -hmm. which uh, you're going to appreciate the commentary on this as well, talking about Advent as an opportunity to rethink our relationship to time. That is exactly and, the phrase. I just want to say uh, to affirm that, that that is exactly the phrase that I pulled out of the commentary and I think would be a great homiletical direction. Yeah. Say more about that. No, I, I really appreciate I didn't want to, I, I don't mean to interrupt. So if you have more to say about that, but I, uh, I, I've always got more to throw in somewhere along the way. <laughs> no, no you that Advent, Advent is an opportunity to rethink our relationship with time, particularly when you think of 
uh, how do you how do you measure waiting? Um, how long do we wait? Uh, the fact that the that the a temporal of God is entering into the temporal. We'll get more of that next week with John's Gospel. Uh, that and so the ways in which John we, coming up. Yeah, next oh, week. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Wonder who, who who would know that. <laughs> temporal, a temporal. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and just how time time just feels different uh, in in a season of anticipation or how really this, these weeks up till Christmas time is just kind of different. And, and the way in which events in our lives do kind of alter our experience of time. And so it's not helping people realize that this is not just an Advent thing, but this is what are those moments. And like I was, I was at a, at a uh, preaching conference a couple of weeks ago. Shout out to the Episcopalians of the, in Canada. Woohoo. Yay, Episcopalians in Canada. I mean, there were other, uh, but I said I would do a shout out to them. So hello. Uh, hello to the Canadian Episcopalians. I preached at a, a Episcopalian church, Christ Church, Deer Park. And, but, but talking there about, uh, about having conversations with people about time, particularly coming out of the pandemic, like how that altered our time. And then I was having a conversation with someone about just coming up on this second Christmas without my dad and my second Thanksgiving without. And I, I'm looking back and saying, what what happened to the year? Like, how is it possible that I've had an entire year without my my father in my life, and it de- like time both stands still and and yet keeps marching on, and so it's a really it's like a reorientation of time, and so uh, I really found that compelling of thinking about Advent as uh, as as an opportunity to reflect on. What does it mean to keep time? What does it mean to keep God's time? What does it mean to keep the church's time? Because, you know, we're having the beginning of the church year, but, you know, in, in December and everybody else is waiting for the new year to begin in January. So there's something about, there's something about, you know, the Kairos time or, but the, but the, about faith time that uh, we can connect with other Reexaminations of time in our lives, and I think that that yeah, that was just really meaningful for me to consider. I I I, I appreciate that, and uh, also um, appreciated that in the commentary, um, and your line that you just said, Caroline. I think it's key uh, to remind us to remind your listeners that we do count time differently, and it is most evident in that we begin the year. Um, in December, um, and we begin it with uh, telling this anticipation of God's presence. We usually uh, are telling people to add verses to the readings. Yes, you could you could take away ten through fifteen here, and that wouldn't necessarily ruin your sermon. In case you <laughs> want to cut verses, uh, and I just say that because here you've got the place where Second Timothy talks about the destruction of the world with fire, and I. Th- think if you randomly polled people and asked them, how does the Bible say the world is going to end, that the majority opinion you would get or the highest number of votes would go to God's going to destroy the world or something like that, as if the world is somehow, you know, marked for destruction. Mm-hmm. And that's really an outlying view. Second Peter is the place where it's there most prominently. And it, it appears to be more uh, an understanding of ancient stoicism than it is anything else that's biblical. And so if you're going to read verses 10 through 15, the, <laughs> uh, those are going to stick me people's imagination. So, you know, just Google stoic conflagration or something like that. And, you know, you can read stoic uh, imaginations about the world being boiled down to its essential parts and, and then be being reformed. Uh, I just think it's a, a view that has caused a lot of environmental mischief and not sure you need that on Advent too, but if you want to talk about it, go right ahead. But 
but I would want people to know that this is very much not the, the most dominant view we find in the New Testament as authors look to the future.